He's now served 36 years in prison for a crime we believe he did not commit. There is an absolute formula to frame innocent people, and these 10 things, or most of them, come up time and time again. Um, what we should remember is that when Julie first went to the police, she didn't say Jeremy had done this. She actually said, well, Jeremy had hired a hitman to do mm. this. So when the police found that he had this cast iron alibi, they didn't go back to Julie and say, you know, sorry, Julie, this is not quite working out in the way you say. In effect, they said, well, OK, well, not to worry, have another go. The fact that the initial assumption was that it was a murder-suicide. And one of the results of that is they, they just didn't do a lot of these tests. For instance, the police surgeon didn't take the body temperatures. Now, if he'd done that, it would have shown that Sheila died four or five hours after the, other, after the others had. And that would have been the end of the story. People's misconceptions of him are, you know, he was arrogant and a womanizer and all this. It's just, that's just the media. We've got to make we've got to make our voice heard. We've got to make Jeremy's voice heard, and we've got to let th the world know that this is an innocent man who's 36 years of a stolen life who still hasn't had the opportunity to grieve for his family, because from day one they knew Jeremy was innocent. And from 3:26, when Neville rang the police, they've known that Jeremy was innocent. So you know, 36 years down the line, they still know Jeremy is innocent. And they should ask Witness themselves, statements. you know, why Essex police are going to such extraordinary lengths after all this time to still not release this material. People don't act in that way for, except for a very good reason. Before the podcast, here's a word from our sponsor. When's the last time you got rewarded for brushing your teeth? With Quip's smart electric toothbrush... Good habits can earn you great perks, like free products, gift cards, and more. You've probably heard us talk about Quip a million times, but this is something brand new that rewards you in your mouth. The Quip Smart Brush for adults and kids connects to the Quip app with Bluetooth. Track when and how well you brush. Get tips and coaching to improve your habits. Earn points for daily brushing and bonus points for completing challenges like streaks. Redeem for rewards like free products, gift cards and discounts from Quip and Partners. Start getting rewards for brushing your teeth today. Go to getquip.com slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N right now to save $10 on a Quip smart electric toothbrush that's ten dollars off a smart electric toothbrush at getquip.com slash sean spelled g-e-t-q-u-i-p dot com slash sean s-h-a-u-n quip the good habits company sensitive sonic vibrations for an effective clean that's gentle on your sensitive gums why People brush too hard and some electric toothbrushes are too abrasive. We have got four of us in the studio today. And Matthew is in his legendary orange attire. Good Describe afternoon to you all. And, uh, <laughs> hello. <laughs> his videos have become some of the most watched and banned on the channel in recent months. No controversy there. But one of the very important subjects that he has been researching is the tragic case of Jeremy Bamba. He's now served 36 years in prison for a crime we believe he did not commit. Now, if you've watched The White House Farm Murders on Netflix, originally on ITV, you may have formed your own opinion about this case. And my parents watched it before me. And they contacted me and they said he looks really guilty. That's how, what they felt after watching this. So I watched it with my knowledge of the justice system and having wrote this book, Unmaking a Murderer, which details the 10 methods 
that law enforcement prosecutors, detectives use to frame innocent people. So with my antennae up watching the documentary, it was triggering all of these points. No physical evidence, get an emotional reaction from the jury, you know, character assassination of the defendant, no physical evidence. They jump on things that are going to create emotional reactions from the audience, from the jury, from the public in the news stories they put out and they contaminate the case. And when, once people are in that hyped up emotional state, looking at these, you know, heinous crime scene photos, then they're willing to, oops, can everybody um, get the stuff on silent? <laughs> they're willing to convict anybody in America. They say they would convict, uh, a grand jury would convict a ham sandwich. That's, that's one of the sayings they have in America. So many of you are familiar with Matthew Steeples of the Steeples Times. His links are going to be in the description box below the video. Do you just want to briefly introduce yourself, Matthew? Um, well, I'm, I'm the founder of an online publication that covers all sorts of different stories, but some of them are true crime stories. And one of them that became very interesting to me was the Jeremy Bamber case, because I would had previous involvement with other cases involving the Essex police, and I found that the Essex police had a lot of problems with various ways they'd handled matters. And in this case, there are so many discrepancies that don't make sense, particularly if you focus on phone calls and the way police officers took evidence to their garden and burnt it and things like that. And we've also got Yvonne and Philip from the Jeremy Bamba Innocence Campaign. And they're going to give you their official titles. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm the head of communications for the campaign. Uh, I deal with uh, things such as political lobbying, uh, approaching politicians to try and get them on board to help uh, bring Jeremy's case uh, even more high profile. Uh, so that's my main role in the, in the campaign. And Yvonne? I'm Yvonne Hartley. I'm, I'm co-administrator of the Innocence Campaign. I also act as forensic liaison manager. So for when we need forensics doing that, contact the relevant people we need. Um, I also assist Jeremy with his research, and I have done for 11 years. So basically analysed all of the 375,000 case documents and currently assist in the legal team with the submissions and in the legal work that we're doing at the moment on the case. How long does it take to analyse 375,000 case documents? A long time. <laughs> A long time. That is dedication but that's only the tip of the iceberg we, we, we understand that there are actually four million documents in total associated Good with grief. the case oh and you're, you're not able to get access that's to a right lot of those yeah, the, the rest have not right. been disclosed which is one of the major problems that has brought us to and, this and which which politician decided that, that well there, there are th I mean, this is, I'm sure we'll talk in this, on this in more detail later, mm. but in terms of the disclosure, there are three court orders in place that have ordered Essex Police to produce all the material relevant to the case, and they've just refused to comply with those. Wow. Uh, and it seems extraordinary that they can appear to put themselves, in effect, above the law, that uh, they can ignore the courts. The material that we've got now what was produced after the last appeal, which was 2002, so these court orders were in place then. So the legal team, as it was then, thought that this wealth of material they got was the full disclosure they were supposed to get. But we didn't get that disclosed until 2011 because there was public interest immunity on a lot of it. So when the rules on that change in 2011, we were then allowed that material. And it's the analysis of this material has then brought to light the other material that's missing and there's more missing than what we've got and where, where do you stand currently with um pretty patel particularly because um, she is well a local yes well, mp she, to that area as you say she has some skin in this yes, particular game yes. as i'd say in the u.s um well she can't as we understand it interfere in the legal process so should the ccrc refer jeremy's case uh -huh. As we saw in the Colin Pitchfork situation recently, she can't overrule any judgment they might make. But obviously she can set the mood music around any sort of appeal. 
So yes, we hope that she does the honourable thing and uh, you know recuses herself from any part in the, in the deliberations. So for people not familiar with this case, then could you just set the table and describe the nuts and bolts of what happened? Okay. Alleg what allegedly happened? And yes. What, well, the, the, yeah. the Crown's case was that on the seventh of August, nineteen eighty-five, Jeremy Bamber. Uh, made entry to White House Farm through a, a downstairs window at about three o'clock in the morning. Uh, he then took a gun, a rifle, 0 .22 rifle that he left on the kitchen table. Uh, and then, having loaded the gun with ammunition he'd also left uh, in, in the same place earlier that evening, he then killed five members of his family. Uh, his father, Neville, his mother, June, his sister, Sheila, and her twin boys, Nicholas and Daniel. And then having done that, he exited from a kitchen window downstairs that he then banged from the outside to give the impression that it, it had been locked and that nobody had come into the house. Uh, and then, according to the Crown, he got on his mother's bike that he brought with him and cycled back to his own house in uh, the village of Goldhanger, which is about three miles away, and then subsequently called the police claiming that he... Jeremy had had a phone call from his father saying that his sister had gone berserk with the rifle and would he, Jeremy, come over and assist him to deal with that situation. And he served 36 years for this now. Yes. So on the documentary, it, it focuses on the sister's history of mental illness. And in the beginning, before other interested parties mm. intercede, the cop, the head detective of that case, he's convinced that the sister has done it. That's right. And he had very good reason to come to that conclusion. Um, and the drama that you refer to um, shows him as a sort of bit of a bumbling fool who who leapt to a you know an unsupported conclusion and just stuck with it regardless of what other people were saying. But But in fact, that's not the case. He had at least four or five good reasons to assume, well, not to assume, to know that Sheila Cofell had been responsible for that. Uh, and one of the great tragedies of the case is that he died in a in a freak accident before the trial. And had he lived, the, the, this none of this would have ever have happened because he wouldn't have allowed this other tainted evidence to be brought to trial. He would have said, this is nonsense. Uh, so obviously the fact he died was a tragedy for him and his family, but also for Jeremy as well. Um, a lot of people say to us, um, well, Sheila was this frail little thing and she couldn't have overpowered her father. And, you know, she she was paranoid schizophrenic. Um, she'd been under treatment since 1983. For that, she'd been in hospital twice. Um, she was medicated by injection because she kept forgetting to take her medicine. Um, so, but on the... the the month before the tragedies in the July, instead of her regular dosage of 200 milligrams of haloperidol, which was then given on a fortnightly basis, it was changed to 100 milligrams monthly. So on the very first time she'd had that dosage was during that time period when the events happened at the farm. But, but um, wouldn't you also say that she was brought up on a farm so she was able to handle guns. She mm. had she had all the capability of... Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it wasn't a complicated weapon. It was a .22 semi-automatic rifle with a magazine. You know, I've not been around guns that I could load one. I could load a magazine to a rifle. Mm. You know, not having to cock it or anything like that. Um, you know, she'd been around them all her life. She'd been on shoots. You know, she'd been on beating holidays and, and everything. She'd experienced, she'd seen these items used every day of her upbringing. You know, when she was at the farm, the guns were out. I mean, that's another prosecution allegation is that they were in a locked gun cupboard. They weren't. There were guns all over the house on a regular basis. So, you know, she was just used to it. So I had a situation in America then where I brought my best friend over and there was a shooting accident that resulted in a corpse on his doorstep. And the homicide detective took him in right away and, you know, did all the gunpowder testing and all that stuff and said, yeah, obviously you, you weren't, you know, involved in this. The person shot himself. What about gunpowder tests? They had actually a, a dog there at the scene when Jeremy was there with the police. Because what happened was 
when Jeremy rang the police and he asked him to meet them at the farm. Uh, he went and drove, he, uh, he arrived about two minutes after the, they did, he was directly behind their car. And there, there was this drug, uh, not drug stock, so, um, gun residue dog turned up. And it sat next to Jeremy, it didn't indicate any gunshot residue or anything. They didn't conduct gunshot residue tests on Sheila. What they did was they conducted lead tests. And we've recently found brand new evidence about copper levels, which they didn't investigate at the time, um, which proves that they had a group of scientists who they had handle the rifle and load it, and then immediately were testing them and saying that, oh, well, their lead levels are higher than Sheila's were. But Sheila was deceased at the scene. It was hours before her hands were backed. You know, we know she was still alive when they went to the house. So they know she was alive when they entered the house. So how how do you feel about the particular issue of the silencers? Which well, is that, obviously the key. Yeah, that, that's one of the, the key, key things. But things actually, just case. can I just pick on on something Sean already mentioned? That you know the fact that the initial assumption was that it was a murder suicide, and one of the results of that is they they just didn't do a lot of these tests. For instance, the police surgeon didn't take the body temperatures. Now, if he'd done that, it would have shown that Sheila died four or five hours after the other after the others had. And that would have been the end of the story. But because they, they knew it's murder-suicide, they didn't feel it was necessary to do that. Uh, and that's one of the things that's bedeviled you know, Jeremy's position because he, he can't say, well, look at the body temperature charts because there aren't any. And so uh, the pathologist as well only commented on the gunshot injuries. And ever since that's been used as in detriment to Jeremy because they've said, well, Sheila had no signs of defensive injuries on her. She actually did. Mm -hmm. But the pathologist at the time didn't note them because they weren't relevant. She'd she'd taken her own life after killing the family. That's what he was told. You know, all the evidence showed that. And so he didn't need to go into, you know, every little mark or aspect or scratch or gouge or bruise. He didn't need to do that because it was a murder-suicide investigation. What was Jeremy like as a young man then? Did he have any history of violence or criminal records or no, mental illness? None at, no, none nothing at all. At all. Could you paint a little bit of a picture of how, what his life was like? What, uh, what well, kind he, of, what he kind grew of up he? on White House Farm. He, he, he'd he been adopted at a very young age, just m months old, as as was Sheila, who'd been adopted a couple of years earlier. And they had a pretty idyllic childhood. They grew up on a lovely farm in a nice part of the country. Uh, they both went to private schools, so that they both had a good education. Uh, Jeremy eventually left school at 16 um, because I think he just had enough of education by that by that time uh, and went off and did various things such as traveling to Australia and New Zealand to, to learn about farming techniques in, in those countries. So up to the point of the tragedy, he'd had a pretty ordinary life with nothing exceptional, certainly no criminal convictions. Well, the, the person I know who was at school with him always says, you know, he was mm. someone they brought home to their family. Well, home yeah, but very and, much uh, so, yeah. You know. the, the person concerned was, you know, the mother was a famous writer. Oh, and right. um, they say, you know, he was just a lovely boy that yeah, came yeah, back yeah. to see them. And they yeah. were very surprised when all of this yeah. happened. Well, so. yeah, I, I'm sure they were. He was very polite, well yeah. brought up. And, yeah. People's misconceptions of him are, you know, he was arrogant and a womanizer and all this. It's just, that's just the media. That's just the media that Jeremy I know is shy and, you know, I mean, we, we've come and, to learn And how do you well particularly and, feel about um, the lady called uh, Julie Mugford who, uh, <laughs> who sold, <laughs> sold her, st her story on the basis that, um, you know, of a conviction? We see Julie Mugford was absolutely convinced that she was going to be Mrs. Bamba. Mm. She'd picked out, she wanted to live at Vaulty Manor. She was like, I mean, there was a lot of property. There was a lot of business interests. Jeremy was going to be very wealthy, you know? He was already wealthy anyway in his own sort of, you know, for his age group. And she wanted to be the future Mrs. Bamba. I mean, you know, he wasn't unattractive. You know, a lot of women were attracted to him and, you know, she had Jeremy and, if the relationship started going downhill before the tragedies, um, after the tragedy, she still stuck by Jeremy. She was still like, you know, she, there was no marks on him, no nothing. She was still sleeping with him. She was still, this is, you know, her future husband. And she even told people that they were engaged. They weren't, but she told people that they were. That was her dream. 
So when Jeremy ended the relationship, it only took a matter of days and she was them. He told me he got hit, man. He told me this. He's been planning it a year. None of that before. So would you say she was a fa complete fantasist? She even admitted to the police, yeah, because she even admitted to the police that she once put a pillow over his head um, just as Jeremy was breaking up with her and, and tried to smother him and said, if you're dead, no one else can have him. I mean, she was that was her man and no one else was going to have her man. And she's got her wish now. Cause you know and she she, paid, she lives in Canada now and has right. a new life and, and yeah, she got paid right. twenty all her uh, criminal charges she had criminal charges that would have been against her trainee teacher of um, drug offences so she had been smuggling drugs from Canada before she knew Jeremy she'd been dealing drugs at college she'd been propagating them with Jeremy she'd had her part in the caravan burglary where she was a willing accomplice. She'd committed checkbook fraud with her friend. And people, have, that's another misconception because at the trial it was put as though she committed a singular checkbook fraud. But it amounted to nearly £900. Check guarantee cards only went to, what, £50 maximum in 1984 when this happened. So it was like she made at least 13 checkbook offences. You know, but all those charges were dropped on the condition she gave Crown evidence. Yeah, this is number eight on my mm. checklist of the 10 things that they applied to set up innocent people. And I think we're going to hit all 10 in this conversation today. And I just want to highlight that as we do, because it is a formula. There is an absolute formula to frame innocent people. And these 10 things on most of them come up time and time again. And just going back then to what you said about um, the kids were adopted. So were, were siblings adopted? Like, were they naturally from no. the same parents? No, yeah. they, they had no biological link. The, uh, the Jeremy Jeremy's father was um, somebody who worked at Buckingham Palace. Well, and, both his parents and did, they, yes. And they, he still lives in Knightsbridge, yeah. and I, yeah. I know of him. Oh, right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but obviously they have no contact, but he, he ultimately... They, the, 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 he had a, an affair with a lady, I believe, and, right, yeah. and the, they were both married independently to other people, and ultimately they ended up married, and they've got other children. They've got other Jeremy's yes. got actual blood, but he has no contact sister. with them, no, no whatsoever, from no, what I gather. No. What about the sister's parents? Well, she, she did find her natural mother actually just before the the tragedy, so earlier in 1985. And they had a, a very emotional reunion. Her, her mother, ironically, given Julie Mugford's current whereabouts, she was from Canada as well. So her mother actually came over to the UK from Canada to, to meet uh, Sheila. And they got on very, very well. And uh, Sheila was really thrilled about this because it's something that had you know, bothered her for some time. So that well, part, What a tragedy that she didn't you well, know, make a reunion uh, with her and maybe yeah. rebuild See, her think, life in a better way. I think yes, that exactly. partly contributed to what happened. Mm. Because Sheila had been searching for her blood mother for a lot of years. People had been helping her do that. And she saw her for like two days and then she left. So it was like, to me with Sheila, I, I feel like I've come to know Sheila a bit with all the research I've done. And there were a lot of things happened with Sheila that was like uh, positives, but then they were taken from her. So it's like meeting her mother, you know, for the first time. She was so excited about that. She looked up to that for years, and it was she'd just come out of the hospital, so she was heavily medicated at the time. She met her mother. They'd arranged to meet again, but then the mother went back to Canada. So that's like, you know, you get something, then you've lost it. It was the same with the children. And, and how do you feel about the, the family's particular um, religious... They were very, very been, religious family. I think and, it's been overplayed. That, that's overplayed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, June was a philosopher. She loved the philosophy of religion. And yes, she did get more religious in, in the later months. But it was more the philosophy. So she'd go to Bible studies and get a passage. And, you know, what is the meaning of that? How can I make that relevant to today's society? How can I help people? in respect of what he's telling me to do here or advising me. So it's more philosophy of things. But Sheila got very religious, didn't she? And, you know, she she was like, you know, thought that, you know, that her her friend at the time was the devil and that... And wasn't there an issue to do with the, the Bible and the, the suicide note? 
Yeah, well, yes, that's part of the exculpatory evidence. But sorry, can I just jump back to you were asking about Julie Mugford and was she a fantasist? Um, What we should remember is that when Julie first went to the police, she didn't say Jeremy had done this. She actually said, well, Jeremy had hired a hitman to do Mm. this. And she named... Wasn't there something about a wetsuit? Yeah, well, yes, that's well, also... That was the uncle. We'll, we'll tell you about <laughs> but, that one in a minute. But when she said about the hitman, she named this guy Matthew McDonald, who who was somebody they knew from down the pub, who had a sort of slightly shady reputation. So mm. she'd obviously picked on what she thought was the most likely sort of person mm. to do something like this. Um, but fortunately for him, he had an absolutely cast iron alibi for the evening in question. Otherwise, you know, he'd have been in serious trouble as well. So when the police found that he had this cast iron alibi, they didn't go back to Julie and say, you know, sorry, Julie, this is not quite working out in the way you say. In effect, they said, well, OK, well, not to worry. Have another go. But and actually, it, they still use that hate man evidence at the trial. Yeah, I mean, extraordinary. So they told the jury, oh, Julie said Jeremy hired a hate man. You know, and it's like... They knew that was a lie. And where was the financial trail to that hit? Well, yes, exactly. There was. That is there, was there was none. You know, like any of these cases that I look right. at, follow where the is money. the fight? Yeah, follow the money, money and yeah. you always end up with the truth. Yeah, because she said he, yeah. she she said that Jeremy had paid him £2,000, mm. but as you say, there was no evidence of that at all. Mm. But as well, bringing the financial things into it, Julie was also promised reward money of £25,000 if Jeremy was convicted from who, who did that come the who did that come the news of the, the world the news of the world and then that, at that on time on the day of the verdict she was there in a hotel room with two of the police officers waiting and the, and for the, the news of the world and the news of the world and we should remember that's a you know it's a lot of money now but in in 1986 she bought a three bedroom flat in London with that so you think what well, that would be worth now and that sort of gives you the context of how much life changing money that was for her who got Jeremy's inheritance the relatives. the relatives was it that one that was like the other one the one was it a cousin that was like kind of like suspected well, they, they, and then they, started they were, to like go against him well there were several because the once the jeremy came under suspicion that the relatives jumped on the situation very quickly and in fact the first thing they did they actually disinherited him from his maternal grandmother's estate which would have been the case <laughs> even if he'd been found innocent because they, she was 95 at the time and in, in poor health and in a sort of home being looked after. Uh, and they implied to her that Jeremy had also been killed in the tragedy because they just said to her, well, the boys have been killed as well. And then Robert, the uncle, uh, Robert Boutflower, persuaded her to change her will to take out the in-issue clause, which means that because um, the grandmother Mabel's two daughters, June, Jeremy's mother and Pam, her, his aunt, would have inherited jointly, but because June was killed in the tragedy, it would have then gone down to Jeremy. But by removing this in issue clause, it meant it wouldn't, and they all would have gone to Robert's wife, Pamela. So in effect, they deprived him of half his grandmother's inheritance even before the trial had started. So that set the pattern for what happened. Well, after. I think that started actually the day after because on the 8th of August, so the, the tragedies were on the 7th, on the 8th, I mean, they were like, vroom, at Jeremy's cottage. They weren't missing a trick. So they were there, every word. I mean, there was no privacy to his police statement. They were there, sat, taking notes. And it's like, really, on the same day, he was asked for his mother's engagement and wedding ring and a painting. And he said, absolutely not, no. The day after, he had to go, the accountant, who was the executor of the estate, said, look, we need to... With wages to pay, we're in the middle of our. D- didn't he have to go to an auction house, Sotheby's or Christie's? Oh, that was later. I'll tell you about yes. that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like the day after, so he had to go because the wages to pay, the farm workers, the responsibilities. So the accountant took Jeremy to the solicitors to arrange that the manager be put in place for the farm, so that that could continue. And in the meantime, till everything was sorted out. Well, it was at that meeting that they found out that the relatives were getting £100 and £250, and that was the cousins. That was it. Nothing else, no properties, land, houses, money, assets, nothing. But one of the houses that the uncle particularly lived in was owned by the grandmother, and he paid just a nominal amount of rent on that. And so, I mean, we've even got... We're very fortunate because... We've got statements that they never thought we'd ever get because we've got draft copies. 
we've got notes, we've got the, what they made at the time. But they never it thought for a moment we'd get. And on it, it'll say, oh, can't say that. And it's like, gone looking around the handbags. I mean, June and Sheila have been dead for hours, looking in the handbags for any money, looking in Neville's pockets. Dad took £400 from Neville's wallet. Yeah, and it's really, you know, thank goodness they made the notes because then we know the evidence, but... But, know, after, never... but after Jeremy's conv conviction, they inherited all of Neville and June's estate. Which and was quite considerable. Con so very consi explain what Very that considerable. Was, and, and for instance, be... just one of the assets was the caravan yes. park. And how many well, acres was the farm? Ooh, the, well, the f I'm not sure. Multiple that's, acres. That's 350, I think. Yeah, it? and this different... There's different businesses attached. Um, I mean, we've done a, a videos on just how comprehensive the assets were because there was land, there was building, there was farm, there was businesses, there was there shares caravan and other parks. businesses. Yeah. Exactly. It was absolutely huge. I did, mean, did the jury know about these financial interests? Well, or was that, that shielded from them? Then they was told that Jeremy had committed these acts because he was greedy and couldn't wait for the inheritance. But the jury actually questioned the credibility of the uncle Robert. and said, um, you know, if if Jeremy was convicted and locked away for a lot of years, who would inherit the estate? Would it be his uncle and family? And would this give him a reason to lie? And would this give him motive to lie? So obviously the prosecution was, you need to answer this because the jury are waiting for this answer. His own response was he was a wealthy man in his own right, but he didn't tell them was that he'd already inherited, his wife had already inherited in July, Mabel Speakman's estate. So the June and Neville's estate and Sheila's estate went to Mabel's estate. And then she died in February and her estate went solely to Pamela in the July, but the jury weren't told that. So, so no, in essence, they were that fact was hidden from them. So, so do you think that false evidence was used or planted? That's one well, of the things I've got on my checklist. Well, going back to what Matthew mentioned earlier about the two silencers. I mean, this yes, is, the is, silencer is, is yes, the, it, one it, of the key things. It's yes, it, very, very much so. Well, we should start our answer by saying that we know the silencer wasn't used at all. Um, we, we've had extensive studies done by sort of eminent pathologists in the US who've looked at the wounds, you know, examined all the physical evidence uh, and are quite categorical that the, the, the Wasn't shot... there a test involving a pig? Well, yes. Well, in fact, I remember you, watching the program. Yeah, about indeed. That, well, that, so. that was Mark Williams Thomas program in uh, 2011. And you can find that on YouTube. Uh, and in that, Philip Boyce, who's our ballistics expert, demonstrates very clearly with a, with a pig carcass mm. um, the difference between a shot fired with the moderator and without. And you can see by comparing the one with without to the crime scene photos that it, it's obvious that a, a moderator wasn't used. Uh, however, because this is such a key part of the Crown's case, we have to sort of deal with it. Um, and what they said in essence was that there was a single moderator that was found with a small amount of blood on the end that belonged to Sheila Caffell and paint scratchings on it that had come from a struggle in the kitchen between Jeremy and his father during the course of the shootings. Now, what we found now is that, in fact, there were two moderators. Uh, the police found one on the day of the tragedy, the 7th of August, uh, and the relatives, who pop up again, found another one on the 10th of, 10th of August, yeah. um, which they then handed into the police. Now, there was some blood on one of these and a blood grouping was done and it did match Sheila Caffell's. But what the jury went told, that it also matched exactly Robert Boutflow's, the key prosecution witness. It also matched 8% of the UK population. So it, it, it could have been you know, a huge number of different people because blood grouping is not a, um, a science of identification. It's a science of elimination. You can't say on the basis of blood grouping this belongs to a particular person because there are no unique. And moving on from from that, um, what do you feel about the photographs of the kitchen with the marks on the the well, wall, they, which they were, were allegedly caused by this? Yeah, they, well, they, they, well, they, they weren't there. They, the, they weren't there on the day. They weren't um, there on the day. Um, uh, we had 
um, ballistics expert. We had photography experts look at this issue. There's no paint flakes on the floor. But over the last four years, we stripped the case right back. After the refusal by uh, CPS before, we was like, do you know what? We're going to go right back to the beginning and we're going to start again. And we're going to start and we're going to see, you know, what we know now. Because the more you know, the more you know. So it's easier to find the things. So we went back to the beginning. And so not only can we now prove there were no scratch marks underneath the mantle shelf that day, which the Crown said were made with the silencer on the rifle, scratching the underneath of the mantle shelf during a struggle. We can now prove not only with photographic evidence, but by forensic analysis of the spoken word of police officers, um, that there was no paint, scientific documents, We've got that now unravel, there was no paint on the end of the silencer that day. The only time that became relevant was when Jeremy was arrested and released without charge on the 13th of August. When that happened, then all of a sudden, there's now paint on the end of this silencer. There's now scratches photographed underneath the, the mantel shelf. We know who did it. It's in the submissions and it's also in a complete police complaint we have active at the moment so but it's also a case of which silence <laughs> well, that, that, that's well we the actually other, yeah. know which we silence know which side. <laughs> the, the blood was on the one that was given the reference sbj1 which was named after the officer who found it stanley brian jones uh the other one was deep no oh is it the other way around sorry <laughs> the Pol blood was on the silencer that they called oh, sorry, db1, DB1 sorry, though. which they got from the relatives and the paint was on the silencer reference SBJ one. And was, there, was, was there a hair place. as well? Yeah, well, that's the a different. Hair. Yeah, that's a different issue. The mystery of the grey hair. I love the grey hair. So they said that there was a <laughs> that nobody saw a grey hair on the silencer at all until Stan Jones went to collect it from the relatives on the third on the twelfth of August. And when he was there, he was like, "Oh, there's a grey hair. Never had grey hair. Must be his." So he puts it in a toilet roll tube, threw it in the back of his car after having a bit of whiskey. Next day, he took it to the police station, showing the other, look, there's a grey hair. Oh, it never got to the lab. It was never forensically tested. It got lost. Moving on, wasn't there another problem with some whiskey as well to do with a police officer? Oh, well, that's the same one. Same one. The yeah. same one. <laughs> yeah. This man and the whiskey were rather, yes. rather, yes. rather familiar. Yes, Jones. He <laughs> has quite liked his bottle of whiskey. But by the time of the trial, they still used that grey hair. They said at the trial, Neville Bamba was hit over the head with a silencer attached because his grey hair was attached to it. And it's like, well, you never even tested it. No scientist ever saw it. It was lost. But we found it. So about four years ago, we found that grey hair. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so they have an action. Puzzle of the grey hair. The, yeah. the mystery yeah. of it. But it's, it's so... Relevant because the jury should not have been, yes. should never have been raised in evidence, but it was used to, to support the prosecution theory, and it never should have been. But we found that grey hair. DS Jones again had sellotaped it to the police action. Now we've got a photocopy of that. We haven't got the actual action, so we've said, give us that grey hair. We'll go and DNA test it, and we'll prove didn't come from Neville Bamber at all, because it's not related. But the jury are painted so many much misinformation that, you know, it's like a, a spiral effect, that one leads on to another, onto, and they're like, oh, and they begin to believe it. And, you know, it's the jury aren't scientifically. You know, they're not, in the, they're not there to say, oh, well, wait a minute, you said that they're there based on the evidence that they're presented with. Mm. And if the evidence they're presented with is fabrication and misinterpretation and downright lies by people. You Could know. you detail some of the other evidence that was, well, can was I disappeared? Just complete, yes. Hold on, can I just complete the point about the two silences? So so you had these two silences and the key the key thing is that the blood was in one and the paint eventually found its way after the tragedy onto the other one. Now they thought these were two incriminating bits of evidence in themselves, but we 
believe that because they didn't think a jury would accept that two moderators had been used during the course of the shootings, because there's no reason why they should have been, they were very simple devices, they conflated the two together and said that both the paint and the blood had come from what had been on one single moderator. And it was that basic sleight of hand that was at the centre of the Crown's case. And it's why they've spent hundreds of thousands of pounds of public money trying to stop disclosure of the documents that would show that but that's, but that's what happened. But in the midst of somebody who is going mad with it, berserk with a gun, as mm. they say, they wouldn't be changing silences. Well, exactly. You wouldn't yeah. have time to do this because yes. you would, yeah. you were absolutely you were dealing with yeah. a, the father who probably could handle yes. himself. Yes, exactly. And you know, if you were killing this, all these other people, then exactly, some yeah. of them would have fought back. <laughs> yes. Yes. But it also played to the Crown's advantage because they said that Sheila couldn't have reached the trigger with the silencer attached. Now, they only said that one was found in the cupboard by the relatives. So they never explained the other one. They will deny the second one exists, mm. but they can't anymore because we've got all the evidence. So, but they said that Sheila couldn't have reached the trigger with the silencer attached. It was her blood in it. So therefore, she was murdered. But m moving back to what I was about to ask you about mm. the, the other evidence that was d that was taken away by police officers mm. to their gardens and burnt and <laughs> all sorts of other things that happened. Yes. Can well, you detail some of that? Well, they burnt a lot of the evidence on the, on the day itself. As the drama showed, they put a big pit in the garden uh, and put a lot of the bloodied carpets, carpets and, and other bedding. items in there because at that time they still thought it was a murder-suicide, so they didn't think any of it would be relevant. Uh, the business about police taking documents to their homes w was a bit later um, but because a lot of the evidence we knew existed because we had references to it. It turns out that the, the senior investigating officer had taken home and had mysteriously disappeared. Uh, so you've covered then another one of these in the last 10 minutes or so, which is pay expert witnesses to lie. <laughs> in yes. America now, it's so common, it's called testy lying. Yeah. And I found out about this through the Snaggletooth killer case in Arizona. My lawyer, Alan Simpson, got him off death row. And a waitress was found dead at a bar. Ray had been at that bar. And there was a bite mark on her that didn't match his teeth. There was DNA that didn't match Ray's DNA. So they suppressed the DNA mm. and they paid an expert witness $50,000 to say his teeth matched the, the, bar, the mark on the victim. Yeah. They gave Ray $5,000 to defend himself and spent millions putting on their side of the show, of the yeah, theater show. Yeah, yeah. So I imagine that um, you had people taking the stand then who said they're experts in, you know, like, like in, a, in making a merger, you saw the her analysis experts and all this mm. kind of stuff, all that cockamamie nonsense. Was that happening in this case? To, to a degree. I mean, the, 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 the forensic people were more manipulated th than actually lying themselves. For instance, going back to the two moderators, um, the, the scientists that were found the paint on the end of one of the moderators at the trial was shown that moderator. So he could truthfully say, well, yes, I looked at this moderator, I found paint on it, blah, blah, blah. The person who found the blood in the other one was given the other one. Again, it was a sleight of hand at trial that, that brought the whole thing to a head. And they, again, could truthfully say, well, yes, I did find blood on the in, in this moderator. But this but, isn't just speculative what we're saying. We've got actual documented mm. facts. We've got, we've managed to put together the chain of evidence you know, and the chain of custody for each exhibit. So you know, it took a long time because it's very complex because they've made it complex. So it's like, well, we'll hide this and we'll we'll merge this with that and but serious of analysis and you know, looking underneath what their guff is is like the truth. So, you know, some scientists we know what one particular scientist examined both silences. We can prove it. You know, we can prove they were there on different days, we can prove you know, that the paint was not there until it was examined on the 25th of September. Wasn't also, there. with regard First to the silence, there wasn't the, the, the length of the gun as a result of it uh, an issue also. Well, because well, they the, way, the way that Sheila Well, yeah, the, the whole of their case rested on the fact that the moderator was on because if it was, then her arms went long enough to yes. pull the trigger to commit suicide. That was the essence of what they were sort of saying. So the length of the gun was yes. obviously key. But as we know, there was no moderator on the gun. Well, in 2002, we had DNA evidence and what was put before the Court of Appeal proving Sheila's DNA was not in silencer. 
uh, that of an unknown male was. Guess whose DNA they didn't take? Uncle Roberts. So, um, so I was going to say then, um, if the justice system is supposed to be about the truth, what motivates the prosecution and the detective to employ this sleight of hand and plant false evidence and you know get experts to lie? What what is the motivation behind it? Is it like, well, we think he did it, so we're just going to frame him because the end justifies the means? Is that the mindset? No, What's the psychology behind it? They made well. First of all, the senior police officer who was put in charge of the investigation eventually was very good friends with the relatives who were persistent. You know, there were 64 times in a month they were on the police doorstep ringing the phone, we need with the chief constable, we need this, we need that, go and investigate this and the other. And the one that they put in place, Ainsley, eventually went to work for the relatives oh. on the caravan park. <laughs> I know, you couldn't make this stuff up. So, really, could you? Oh. so he became their head of security. So he became the head right, of security yeah. when he retired from the police. Well, I'm sure that White House found murders, did it? Come yeah. on. And again, it's, you know, Essex police. You know, yeah. This is how the Essex police yeah. seem to deal with murders. But they made mistakes. Yes. Because we now know that they shot Sheila. Yes, this is the other sort of curveball that people may not be aware of. You know that Sheila was found, or at least at trial it was said, truthfully, that, that she'd been found with two bullet wounds. Well, when she was first found, she only had one. And what? We, well, <laughs> and we have six different statements from police officers, the police surgeon, that show at that point she only had one wound. And the coroner's officer. So what we believed happened, they ran a firearms training exercise after the tragedy had happened. And we have written records that this is what happened. And the gun accidentally discharged during the course of that uh, training exercise, which is what ha is the how the second wound came about. But at trial, again, they didn't say this because it was very prejudicial to, to Jeremy, so it, it helped their case. So the whole thing was slightly surreal. They were talking about a wound that Jeremy had supposedly created that they knew very well had actually been done by one of their officers. And wasn't there supposedly some movement of some bodies within yeah, the, the well, building? Yeah, uh, because when they originally went into the house, Sheila was in the kitchen. Um, she was lying in front of the Arga alongside her, her father. Um, and one of the police officers who looked through the window before the raid said there is a female body in the kitchen and there is another report saying there are two bodies in the kitchen one male and one female so what we believe is that after they've broken in and it took them about 20 seconds to actually get into the house because the back door was very solid it was locked uh, so it took about five or six blows from a sledgehammer to actually get into the house uh, and we believe that during that period either Sheila had been asleep or was sort of slightly comatose because it you know, she hadn't slept for a good while. She ran upstairs, uh, up the main staircase, took the rifle from the window where several police officers had seen it, went into the main bedroom, which was next to where the rifle had been in the window, and committed suicide with the one shot. So mo moving on, um, the, the the movement of the window, that's very key to your... Well, that, that's one yeah, of that's the things. One, it? If that rifle, which was seen by two different officers that we know of, and we believe that a lot more saw it, but that was in undisclosed statements, then it is there is no argument. Jeremy is innocent of at least shooting Sheila because that rifle was the only weapon upstairs. It was found subsequently on her body. And if it had been seen at 7 o'clock by one officer and at 7.40 by another, when Jeremy was standing outside with surrounded by <laughs> dozens of police officers, then the only possible explanation is that Sheila took it from the window and used it to commit suicide. That there, there is no other explanation. I'm still flabbergasted by what you said earlier. How does a weapons training exercise happen at a crime scene? Well, Essex Police's Tactical Firearms Unit had only been formed, I think, relatively recently before Not the tragedy. Before. So they had a lot of people they wanted to train to become part of it. Um, so I suppose, you know, looking at it cynically, it was a an ideal situation to give them a, a, a view of how crimes of this type play out. I mean, the disturbance of the scene is they deny ever disturbing the scene. We can, I mean, it's plain as a nose on your face when you look at the photographs and they're like, we moved two stools. It's like, so did you open that window and who moved that chair and who shut that door and who, there's so much been moved on the crime scene but well, then they later blame Jeremy for it. Mm. So it's like we've actually got photographs that you can see the movement in the photographs 
that they blame Jeremy for. And it's like, but it's quite clear on the photographs. But it's like, you know, we can prove Sheila was alive in the house. There was lights going on. There were curtains closing. There was windows closing. There was, you know, she was in conversation with the police. She made a 999 call from the house. That's when Jeremy's outside with the police. But because, and people will say, yeah, but so why, why they have these police officers hidden it? They haven't. Because that particular officer who saw those curtains open wrote his statement when I was observing the curtains were open. That's his involvement in the case, done. Then you have another officer half an hour later who's observing the same window. Those windows are closed. He writes his statements, his observations. That's his case, done. So it's only bringing all that together. It's only the senior officers who've come, you know what, we'll hide that one and we'll, we'll move that one and we'll change that log and... It's un we can prove the logs were rewritten. So I've got, we got logs missing. I think we've got three more here from the formula covered. Um, conceal other suspects. So the sister, the focus was moved from the sister. Yes. Coerce false confessions. So the ex-girlfriend gladly gave false confessions. Yeah. And then trigger emotional reaction. So I imagine at trial they really focused oh, on yeah. the goriness of the crimes as to as opposed to the lack of any evidence against Jeremy. They showed the jury, which one of my experts have said there is not a chance they should have done this. They showed the jury pictures of the children with shaved heads and the bullet injuries. That's how they do it. They shouldn't have done that. That's how they get the most extreme you know, that's emotional reaction out of somebody. not ethical at all. You don't yeah. do but, that. Show them at the scene... You know, because that's the crime scene photographs, the jury have a right to see the scene of crime. They don't have a right to see children on a pathology table with their head shaved because that's just unethical. It's disrespectful to the children. It's disrespectful to their family. It's just awful. And so they get a And conviction. it's got that emotional pull. I mean, the women... But the, 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 whole case has the, become, the... the whole case has become very emotional. And yeah, that's why, very emotional. why we've ended up with this yeah. life means life tariff. Hmm. And but I mean, there's so many aspects to Jeremy's case. I mean, it's every we can undermine everything that the crown said. So it's like the windows, you know, they said he got he slipped the catch on the bathroom window, slid it up, got in that way, killed everybody, got out the kitchen window. Well, we can prove if they'd have shown the jury the correct photographs from the crime scene, the photograph they showed them was from an angle, so it's the perspective makes the catch look at an angle. From head on, that catch is full. But they didn't tell the jury that the bottom of that window had one of the old-fashioned uh, horizontal latches that went onto a peg. That was secure on its latch. Well, the officers in the house said all the latches secure. That was secure. You can see it on the crown scene photograph. Well, I would imagine. I latch. would imagine the house would have been quite secure anyway, because the, they were wealthy people who yeah. also had guns in their house. Yes, so. exactly. But it's like you know, if if there's no way in and there's no way out, then the person who committed the crime is in the house. Mm. You know, we can prove he didn't get in. So White House Farm admitted that as well, because they just showed oh, yeah. the, the, the dodgy yeah. window, didn't they? Yeah. Well, t a great example of how they distorted the facts is, is how they st they showed Stan Jones, who they they made out to be the hero of the scenario, because he kept going and you know, insisted that Jeremy was guilty. Um, he was one of the people that we got the statement from, saying that Sheila had only had one shot initially, uh, and one of the key scenes in the drama was him seeing her with two shots and saying, "Oh, this Bamba bloke must be guilty because she'd been shot twice," but that was completely against what actually happened where he saw her with just one shot and in his own words he went back to the with to the farm with the pathologist um Venetis next day and in his own words he said i was astonished to be told that she'd been shot twice do you think they just give her a second shot then just to seal the case <laughs> no i think it was ac I accidental it was an accident. i mean she was, no, was not so you think they could be that corrupt no no i think she she was dead. We should make clear she was dead at that point. She had committed suicide, so they didn't kill her, but they shot her. Could, could you address the, another key issue, which is the telephone calls? <laughs> yeah. I think that's a very the telephone, key. Yeah. The telephone yeah. calls. I think are the key thing the to this whole matter yeah. because it's Jeremy's alibi. 
you know, it's it's like hard and fast. Jeremy was telephoned by his father at approximately quarter past three in the morning saying, your sister's gone crazy, she's got hold of one of the guns, I need, you need to help. Um, Jeremy was undecided, he was like, I'll ring him back because the phone went dead. Tried to ring his dad back, the phone was engaged, couldn't get through, tried several times, rang Julie, what should I do? Because Neville and June were very, very private. He was a magistrate, he wouldn't have wanted a fuss. If it could, you know, they might have got there and they might have been all sat around the table having a cup of tea, everything sorted out. So Jeremy was a bit undecided, what should I if, Right, I'm going to ring the police. So at 3.36, Jeremy's call is logged on the police logs. So at 3.26, when Jeremy couldn't get back through to his father because Neville was on the phone to the police. So we've got both the police logs. We've got Neville's call, which talks about his daughter, age 27, going berserk. She got hold of one of my guns and his phone number, his address, 326. We've got Jeremy's call, 336, his address, his phone number, my dad's wrong, my sister's gone crazy, you know, we need help. And um, they've merged those two logs together, but we've got now fresh evidence um, we can prove that cars were dispatched to the scene prior to Jeremy's phone call. Wow. We can prove that at 3.30, one of the officers received a radio call to say, we've had this incident, you need to be going to White House Farm. And then at 3.37, he was contacted again on the telephone to say, "You need have you dispatched it? You need to be going. Uh, it took a long time to find it, but we found it, so we've got even more sort of confirmation that there were two calls. The information on the calls is completely different. Um, now, as his police will tell you, oh, well, that's just because, as he's, this police officer is relaying it to this other police officer, it's his interpretation of how he's written it. And later you well, mentioned sorry, there was a phone mix. call at something six six o'clock or something. Yeah, that that was a set, but that was um, Sheila. Yes, so uh, there are quite a few different phone yeah, calls. Yeah, yeah, but going back to the original ones, I mean, the key point, as you implied, is that at trial they said there was only one call. Hmm. They denied that Neville had phoned the police himself, and in fact they said that Jeremy had never received a call from his father either. So they, they again, it was this two into one that seems to be a recurrent theme in the in the case that they, they merged the two calls and said there was just one by Jeremy and that Neville had never made a call. But now we have this incontrovertible evidence that he had. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the reason that's important, because if they were t- 10 minutes apart, which the logs say they were, uh, the police accept that Jeremy was at Goldhanger at his house when he made his call. And originally we think they tried to engineer it that they could say he'd made both calls that he'd phoned from white house farm pretending he was neville and then got home and made the call from his house to give himself an alibi but that didn't stand up because they tried no matter how they tried they could not get from white house farm to Goldhanger within 10 minutes and that's why eventually they had to just hide Neville's call and say, well, there was only one Jeremy called at 3.36. If he gets exonerated based on this evidence, <laughs> would he have a claim to get his estate back? Yeah, Probably, yes. I mean, it, it would go back to the status quo ante. But how much of it is actually left? Well, a lot. Yes, because... For instance, we were looking at the accounts for the caravan yes. park recently, yes. and that caravan park alone is probably worth about 15 million, and half of that is due to him. So we're, we're talking quite large sums and then, here. Um, it's but it's not all been not bits of it have been sold off or well i think the odd bit of land was sold yes. off but but the caravan park has gone from strength to strength and is is a very substantial business now just on its own that's what i mean that's irrelevant yeah it's irrelevant it's, to jeremy it's, his life now isn't it yes it, yeah. time. you know it's like 36 years of his life has been stolen mm. and you know, we want to rectify that. We want to make sure the courts rectify that. We want the public to hear the truth. I mean, there's so much evidence. Um, you know, we want we want we want people to appreciate that this still does happen. You know, it doesn't just happen with the Birmingham Six and everything. This still goes on. Here in there are hundreds of men and women in jail for crimes they did not commit. And but Jeremy's is like, you know, he's he's the the thorn in the government side because. He will, you know, we will keep at it. We will like, well, there's this, well, there's that, well, there's this, well, there's that. We don't give up. Whereas a lot of people, can you imagine now, disheartening it is. 
to like you try and you try and you do your best and you, they won't give you the paperwork. They won't let you have access to things. And eventually a lot of people just give up. You have quite a few high profile supporters. Could you name a few of them? The, the Peter, Peter, Peter Tatch Peter Tatch Peter Tatch has, 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 has been very supportive, the, particularly the, on the, the disclosures. The, the Baroness, right. yes, but the Conservative uh, but, uh, MP, um, yes, Andrew Hunter, who was, was yeah. Conservative MP for Basingstoke, Jenny Jones, who, yes. Baroness Jones, who very kindly asked some very pertinent questions in the House of Lords on our behalf. So yes, we we do have some very high profile people, um, but disclosure is really at the heart of all this, as it is with it, with most dis, uh, miscarriages of justice. Uh, and in the US, and obviously you, Sean, have a lot of experience of the US system, they got the Brady <coughs> violation, where, as I understand it, if any exculpatory evidence is withheld from a trial, it automatically becomes a mistrial. But over here, you know, despite the fact we founded the common law, that is not the way things work. And you look at all these cases, the Birmingham suits, the Guildford Four or whatever, and disclosure or lack of it is at the heart of that. And it's the same with Jeremy. Next thing on this list is to neutralize honest witnesses. So did people come out and say things in favor of Jeremy who were neutralized from yes. the court proceedings? Yeah. Well, for instance, the 609 emergency call that Sheila made, it was taken by an officer called Nicholas Milbank. Um, he made a statement to that effect, but it just disappeared. And we only found out about this by chance in the, the 2002 investigation that was built around Jeremy's appeal in that year, came across a reference to this. And they put it in their report saying, well, you know, there appears to have been a, a 999 call, which could have only have been made by Sheila at that time. Uh, but that evidence was never given to the defence. It, it never emerged. It still into, hasn't been it still given hasn't. to us. And the problem, I suppose, for you is that a lot of these people are now dead. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that is an so, issue. But it, th this particular officer, um, the, the Guardian journalist, Eric Allison, phoned him up after this emerged and said, did you take a call from Sheila Caffel? Uh, and he just said, well, if the record says I did, then I did. Wow. <laughs> All right about then. <laughs> I don't, did you watch Making a Murder? Did you see Ken Kratz? He was quite a character, wasn't he? The prosecutor. I, I only saw some of it. I didn't see all Very of it. sinister. So uh, on this checklist, I've got higher sociopathic prosecutors. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, in, in Jeremy's case, they did the reverse. They hired a totally useless defence lawyer. <laughs> oh, yeah, we've got here. Ensure that the public defender works for the prosecution. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, Jeremy's defence was done Let's by one. Jeffrey Rivlin, who, who's now a judge actually so we don't want to be too harsh on him in case i ever find myself up in front of him but no he was very from our research and from our analysis he was so for instance ps Buse, who saw the movement in the window he didn't ask the other officer about it he only asked one and that was because jeremy handed him a note asking him about the movement in the window so he said, um, oh, believe you saw a movement in the window. Yeah, was it a trick of the light? Yes, it was. You know, what is, what's he going to say, this police officer? He's not going to say, no, it was actually a figure walking across, going to go, yeah, it was a trick of the light. You know, could it have been a shadow from the moon? Yeah, it was a shadow from the moon. You know, saying to Julie Mugford, did you, did you read newspapers um, before the trial? Is this where you got your information from? And she go, oh, I'm not sure. He went, no, he didn't, did you? She went, no. And it's like, well, just give her the answers then. But he didn't mention <laughs> key, you know, as we mentioned earlier, the fact that blood grouping matched Robert Boutflowers as well. He never told the jury Never that. told the he, jury. He knew never that, but it. he never said that. How did this person come into being involved in this case? Well, uh, by a rather circuitous route. Originally, Jeremy went to um, Sir David Napley, who... Years ago, was a, was he was related to a friend of his. Very eminent, David sir. Napoli, but he was busy and couldn't do the case, and so he referred it through his officers, Kingsley Napoli, and and that's how his defence team came from there. I see. But so it was two things: the fact he didn't make the best use of the material he had, but also to be fair to him, the fact that he didn't have the majority of the material that was relevant because it hadn't been disclosed. And at those times, things like that were yeah. harder to get access yeah, to yeah. anyway yes. because yes. phone and records were not like phone records are yes, today. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you don't have um, a digital trial like you do now. I think no. as well, it's like with the scratch marks, he didn't have any evidence at trial to counteract what the police were saying. Hmm. He was given limited documentation which said that Argo was scratched on the day 
you know, here are, here are statements, here's the scientific evidence, there you are, this, this painting, the end of that silence, uh, there's a proof. So we didn't question it. You know, didn't I, say, I, um, well, wait I've, a been minute. I've been very, very involved with this Mark Alexander case, and, and that, that's partly about phone, mobile phone records. Mm, and, mm. and I think the phone records are your key thing. Yeah, I think because R Rivlin didn't you, know, you know that's what second you, call. If so you want to, he couldn't raise it. I, I, it. It proves a lot of different things. If if somebody makes a phone call well, from it, one place when they're yeah. in another location, yeah, so you can't be in two places at the same time. So yes. if, if that is proven to have happened, that's the end of the game. But the Crown said, you see, they had an answer for this because since um, the trial and everything, they, they had a statement from the police officer who took both phone calls, same officer took both phone calls. But then on one log, we remember at that time of the trial, they had one log. So at the, at the time they're saying it's 326 on this one, but you've written 336 on your statement. Oh, he misread the clock. <laughs> so ever since then, even with the CCRC and with um, the Court of Appeal in 2002, it's like he misread the clock. Well, now, actually, he didn't misread the clock because we're two calls. We've got absolute proof on that. Um, it's gone back to the CCRC with that extra evidence now. And we've just said, absolutely, you know, this is two telephone calls. So you've got to now investigate this properly. You've got it. Why was this hidden? Because from day one, they knew Jeremy was innocent. And from 326, when Neville rang the police, they've known that Jeremy was innocent. So, you know, 36 years down the line, they still know Jeremy is innocent. And that's one of the most shocking things that, you know, there's a lot of police officers who not just had a reason to believe he might be innocent or, you know, maybe this is a bit dodgy. They actually knew he was innocent for certain because they'd seen Sheila walking around the house. They'd seen the rifle in the window. And there was no doubt that that was the only conclusion they could have come to. They had a suicide note. Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, that's something. Yeah, so, you... where, what, I, what, what happened to that suicide? <laughs> well, that's note, a very good question. Yes. <laughs> yes. There you go. More missing evidence. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. More things that got burnt in the garden. Yes. Well, th this ironically was first referred to by Stan Jones himself. He he was the person who raised this. That they two thousand and wasn't it? Wasn't it hidden in a Bible? Well, no, no that's a that, different, that's no, a different one. There was a note in the Bible, but this yes. was different. And he, it, it said, "I have just killed myself." Presumably, because Sheila's state of mind was that having killed her family, that was part of herself, and you know, in her psychotic delusions that she was having at that time, it kind of made sense. Um, but that wording must have stuck in his mind because he quoted it verbatim when he referred to it in 2002. So there's no doubt in our minds there was a suicide note, and in fact, the police had never denied there was a suicide never note. Never denied it. But they've produced a couple of other things they claim with the suicide note, which were actually just child scribbling on bits and of where, paper. And where is he now? Sorry, who stand? Yeah. No, he's died. No, he's yeah, died. He, died. he died a, a few years ago. But yeah. it was his colleague who ended up becoming the head of security. Yes, yeah, Ainsley. Ainsley, yes. Mr. Ainsley is fit and well and hope he stays yes. that way. I'd love to see him in the dock. No yes. doubt he's got his, uh, got his lawyer on speed dial. <laughs> We'd imagine <laughs> at the moment, we hope. So if this gets reversed, are a lot of people's careers on the line who come up with this yes. fake narrative? Yes, I mean, Ainsley particularly, the head of forensics, Cook, who, who is also <coughs> still alive, Julie Mugford, because they, it is absolutely certain that should he be exonerated, she lied because... She was making these alleg She said he was saying this stuff way, way before their relationship ended, at a time when she claimed he was trying to marry her. So there's no, if it, had, if she'd been saying this nearer to the time of the tragedy, she could conceivably say, well, he was trying to get rid of me, so he was saying, oh, I shot all my family. But that's not what she said. She it went back much further than that. So she. So she got perjury consequences. Yes, which is now, well, always was a very serious offence, but, um, you know, now... She is far, far away. She is, but I, I don't, that. hopefully that won't mm. protect her. But yes, I mean, it's not as straightforward as if she was in the UK. So the final thing, and we've hit nine so far, so there's only <laughs> one left, is to rig or taint the jury. So in, on, in Making a Measure, we saw jury members that were related to law enforcement. Mm. Mm. Who were all like wanted them to be convicted. I well, think I, I, it's the fact that the jury were entitled the jury were entitled to know set pieces of evidence that were deliberately withheld from them. So they were entitled to know, like with the with the windows, that on the day of the tragedies, 
the place so no damage whatsoever that three weeks later there was no damage whatsoever that the 8th and 9th of september no signs of entry or exit first of october comes jeremy's have been arrested it's all these scratch marks all over the catches all over the window so the jury went out to know actually well on the day there was no damage there was no damage to this actually the police moved this the police moved that you know so by by inference they were misled and so because they were misled the jury is tainted if they'd have known that one of the beneficiaries blood group matched sheila's blood group and weren't told at trial that blood group should sheila and sheila only nobody else her on her own then would they have had that you know they should have known they should have been told you know they should have been told that the how, how the house was locked and bolted they should have been told there was a 999 call that there was two calls made to the police should have been told ambulances weren't called till after Sheila rang the police at 609 I mean they're at the scene all morning from 10 to 4 and not a single ambulance is called out there's 77 police officers at that scene and nobody thinks to call the play, the ambulances out till after a 999 calls met from the house. Mm. So after after all of this, how how do you feel, you know, Jeremy was portrayed as being this greedy person who went on holiday and went to Sotheby's and sold Spending items. Money. He yeah. was a bit like the Menendez brothers, another yeah. case that I'm very interested in, portrayed to be such a terrible well, that terrible was... person. I can explain the Sotheby's. Um, we have statements from the gentleman at Southern, from Sotheby's representative. And what had happened was Basil Cock, who was the executor of the state, there was a lot of valuable items in the farm. And he was worried, as Jeremy was worried, that, I mean, things were going, things were being filtered out of the house within hours. Uh, as soon as the relatives got in there, and he didn't. You know, he didn't want to go. He didn't going. want to go in the house, from what I recall. So no, I didn't want so, to. Refuse, so that's how they days. were able to take things. Yeah. yeah. Well, they were going on the premise. They were going to clean up. And he actually gave them the keys. But in, ironically, in, in their words, they were looking for clues. But so they were taking not only taking the money, but they were taking jewelry. And we've got their statements where they're going, "Oh, didn't know Granny Bamba's jewelry were here. Right? We'll put that in the drawer." So they were taking all these things. Now there was a lot of antiques in the house so the executor not jeremy the executor of the estate who was also neville's accountant called sotheby's in because he wanted to put some of this stuff not just to get it valued but to put it into protection and I'll, and we have statements from um the the gentleman involved from sotheby's who mr stancliffe who says you know i was asked to go to value these items I took them for safekeeping because there was concerns about the family pilfering. Mm -hmm. And that's in written witness statements, but that's not told to the jury. But there's one other variant on your last point you were saying about tainting the jury. In Jeremy's case, it was actually the judge that was tainted because he was so biased in favour of the, the prosecution as to really steer that. He, he basically told the jury to convict him. Mm. For instance, on on the blood evidence, their their final question they came back with is, "Please, could you review the blood evidence?" Now, Drake, Justice Drake, who who was the judge at the trial, knew that the the sample matched Robert Bartflowers again, and ironically, the prosecution counsel uh, Anthony Arledge actually said, "Isn't it fair that we ask Robert Bartflower to account for this fact?" And the judge just said, "No, no, it isn't. It's it's already been dealt with." So when the the jury came back and said, please summarise this blood evidence, he told them this blood is Sheila's and Sheila's alone. And 17 minutes later, they came back with a guilty verdict. Good grief. So he, he was very much part of the problem. Uh, and that's difficult if, if you've got the person who presiding over the proceedings is, is leaning one particular way very strongly. It's, it's very hard, even without all the evidence that the defence didn't have, to make a difference. Was there just one trial or was there multiple? No, just one. And what was Jeremy's like demeanour and how has he been over the years? Well, clearly at the time he was utterly shocked because he, you know, <laughs> like most of us, had faith in the British justice system, but it, it let him down considerably. So, How old was he when he got convicted? 24. 24. Grief. 
So yeah, he, 60 he, he spent 60% 60 60 of his life in, in jail. But I mean, he's so resilient and hardworking and absolutely dedicated to proving his innocence. He knows he's innocent mm. and he will not stop. I mean, he, you know, he will work as much as he can work to prove his innocence. But I think it's taken the pressure off him a little bit, having us, because we're assisting him. And, and, and how many people other... do you have in your, your group? The very sort of heart of the group is five of us and the campaign team is five but then that as you know it expands wider because it's like a lot of supporters patrons and you know we have we have a uh a facebook supporters who are absolutely amazing and you know we have meetings and they all come and we give them as much information as we can as to i mean we can't tell them everything we don't you know there's certain evidence we can't disclose yet because it's that we're at such critical time I don't want to be sat here giving Essex police anything that they can go, oh, right, well, we'd better go and try and find something to counter this. I'm not going to give them the pleasure of that. So, um, But also you know, we have a lot of forensic experts who we can draw on who very yeah. kindly do the work pro bono, you know, for which we obviously are extremely grateful. So there, there is quite a wide circle of people the, who are you know, championing this cause. And yeah, so who again were and though you might not particularly like the program, the, yeah, the program the program drew interest well, to the case. Interesting, and probably that, for you, yeah. you probably got people who were skeptical of what was said in that yeah. program. Well, yeah. we, you can see that in our Facebook membership yes. numbers. It they they've more than doubled since the program was shown. So well, yes, it has. Probably as a result of that, that we thought, you know, we can't keep letting. Um, television documentaries, the media, the newspapers, authors write what they want. And we are like, we're only a little group, you know, and it's like, we need to make a voice out there that's even stronger. So we want to make more people listen. So that's why we decided, right, we're going to do these meetings so if every month. We're going to put podcasts out, you know. So we've like recently in March when the submissions went into the CCRC, we thought, right, we'll tie that in and we'll, what we'll do, we'll go through each piece of evidence and we'll tell you everything about it. And you can make your decision whether you believe us, but everything's taken from case material. So we'll give you that evidence and you judge for yourself then what you think. So that's what we've been doing, isn't it? Yeah. For the last and, that, sort of and that has had some effect because, sorry, um, there has been a very good Channel 5 programme um, was it Crimes That Shook Britain that was shown it, it was a, five a, or six years ago, but they updated it specifically using some of the new evidence we had, uh, and that attracted a lot of attention as well. So it, in the Menendez case, you know, it was TikTok. The, the, the <laughs> young people started sharing yeah. this, yeah, and, yeah. and hun hundreds of millions of people have now seen this. You know, yeah. it's... Yeah. it's so f social media is obviously your... Yeah, very, oh, absolutely. Very I mean, we have uh, Twitter accounts and everything, but it's like we are determined. We're going to be as noisy as we can, and we're going to make everybody see this injustice, and we're not going to convince everybody that Jeremy is innocent. That isn't what we're about. We're about, we'll put the evidence out there, and if you're not quite sure, listen. rather than going to a television documentary that says, oh, well, he might have smiled on a, at the funeral, you know, I mean, it's totally bizarre. Come and listen to the evidence yourself. You know, come and look at it. We'll show it you. You know, we'll let you read and it we, for we yourself. We haven't come across anybody, who, as I was saying to your colleague there earlier, we haven't come across anybody who's looked at the evidence for more than about an hour who hasn't had at least serious doubts about the soundness of this conviction. Um, because it's not a complicated business. There's a, there's a huge amount of evidence, but it's pretty straightforward, and all of it is uh, exculpatory. Did you say Mark Williams Thomas did something on this? Yes. Well, he he did a program back in 2011, the one that Matthew referred to earlier, um, that does a very good demonstration showing why the moderator wasn't actually on the gun. Uh, and it's very visual. You you can see the evidence. So on, he believes on Jeremy's innocent, doesn't yes, he? Yes. Yeah, yeah. He, he spoke at one of our Zoom meetings very recently and was very, very supportive. So yes, he he does. Yeah, I've right. just actually approached him about something else. So um, yeah. you know, there could be something in the pipeline very soon. Mm. But I mean, everybody who's professional who looks at the case and spends the time because a lot of people go, "Oh, seen that on that is guilty." You know, just take the time, look at the website, listen to one podcast. Mm. You know, we're not d dedicate half an hour. All we want half an hour. Read a bit of the website. 
you know. And make what, your own mind up. And make your own mind up. If you have any questions, come to us. We'll answer your questions. You know, come to our Zoom meetings. Ask us whatever you like. We've, we, you know, we're not inventing this evidence. It's hard facts. It's there. It's documented on police documents. And they should ask themselves, you know, why Essex police are going to such extraordinary lengths after all this time to still not release this material. People don't act in that way for, except for a very good reason. And we believe we know what that reason Hiding is. Hiding the truth. Yeah. Absolutely. And a TV program can make anyone look innocent or mm. guilty depending upon how they want to slant yeah. it. Yes, exactly. And that reaches so many people and that becomes the mm. dominant narrative. Well, it, it was based on Carol Ann Lee's book, who, you know, we don't like giving her too much publicity, but that, that was the, 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 the essence of the script. And, and her book was really a proxy for the prosecution case. So. Have other books come out supporting Jeremy? Yes. You can't get them published. It's like, Although they have it's like really difficult. I've got a publishing company. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, um, there, are, there, are, there are very few, because like I say, you can't out get, they'd rather go with the guilty aspect than the truth you know or if we could if we could get a book out there i mean you know but it's that like, this is one way we could do it with the podcast because it's your podcast is very very good quality i oh, enjoyed thank you. listening to it and you know i mean are, you know it's yeah. research and a lot of publishers and authors all say we've done considerable research i'm sorry you haven't done 11 years 365 days 24 hours a day like we've done and you know this it, i'm not bragging or anything like that but you've got to put that amount of research in to get the detail out to get the facts out mm. because then if somebody comes to us with a you know a question that we're not normally asked we've still got the answer because we've got the background and we've got the the research and you know just just we invite people just ask us anything because you but, know, but one extraordinary, one extraordinary thing is we're still finding exculpatory evidence after all this time. For instance, in the Mark Williams Thomas uh, program you referred to, he spent quite a bit of that program trying trying to work out how the burns that were found on Neville's back. There were three quite large burns, and they could never quite explain it. And Mark comes up with a number of theories during the program back in 2011. But recently, we we found out where those burns did come from. And they were not from the actions of any single person. Not from the actions of a person. And that will be part of a submission that's being added to our sort of case to the CCRC at the, by the end of August. Yeah. It was like so, really by accident come across it. And it was like, I'm going to have a look at this. And I was like, oh, I know where they can. Yeah. And I contacted our experts immediately and went, please, can you just mm. look at this? Am I just being a bit crazy here? And they went, no. You're actually not. Mm. So that is that is another issue that's now resolved. So it's going, it's with the lawyers now. And it also demonstrates further interference with the scene by the police. So it all adds to what we're saying on other issues as well. So is one of Mark's theories correct then? Well, he well no, he he didn't come to a definitive conclusion as to how the marks have been made. They sort of said, well, it you know, it's something it's, it's completely a mystery. you um, wouldn't expect. But we have. We will be able to disclose it in, soon. in due course. That will come out but uh, we have, at the you've, moment, had, you've had uh, some support from some journalists um yes we have think some the, support certain newspapers like the have. guardian yes indeed and your own publication yes, matthew has been very uh, supportive um, so yes we have had one you know, or two. They, they tend to be more impartial because a lot of the other publications are based on very emotional yeah, theories well, particularly the, you know the sun and yeah well we like had that. a front page on the mirror about the two call cool logs that that got a lot of publicity and the local essex newspapers they're very supportive of the fresh evidence and you know they're not afraid of putting it to them make the public you know read it for yourself and see what you think um but i am absolutely confident you see it's it's very difficult to suppose for the media when you've got somebody who's convicted of these heinous crimes that you're going to take their side because they don't want to be seen to be taking, you know, um, a child Most, most people don't want to support but, a man who yeah. kills his own family. Well, yes, exactly. exactly. But yeah. once we can start disclosing this fresh evidence, then there's going to be a very quick turnaround. Well, at the same time, you do have your critics. Yeah. They're, yeah. Are, they're we, on we Facebook particularly. Yeah. They've, they've written to me, these people, and they yeah. get quite, but they you, get quite you, worked up. Yeah. yeah, but you see, most of it, as you say, is emotional. 
they're saying this person's been convicted, he must be guilty. You know, you're all a bunch of whatevers for trying to help him out. But they don't look at the evidence, which is what they should be focusing on. Have you thought of writing a book, Yvonne? <laughs> Often. Have you? <laughs> well, you pretty much already have. So. I'm pretty much already have the other <laughs> podcasts. Yeah. But yeah. Well, no, I mean, the mil- I couldn't tell you how many millions and millions of words I've written on Jeremy's case, but yeah. But the, the other It'd thing be- is when we find all this exculpatory evidence, there's only one avenue you can go down to making the best use of it, and that is the CCRC. So it's not like we found the answer to the Arga, uh, to the to the burns on Neville's back and we phone up a hotline and say, oh, we found this, and they say, oh, yeah, that's great, we'll let him go. You know, that's only the beginning of the process. You've then got to put it all into submissions, get the lawyers to sort of approve it, then put it into the CCRC. They've got to then refer it to the Court of Appeal. And finally, the Court of Appeal have got to agree that you have a good point that overturns and the conviction. You now seem to have a new law. The, the, the latest lawyer seems yes, to be who, very, who, very, who, very, 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 very good. Um, so we are, we are confident, but it's it's a very long process. And, and we're, difficult we're very one. lucky because the legal team will, agree, will work with us. So, um, you know, because, because we understand the issues inside out, back to front and upside down, um, for them to have our help is good for them because it's giving them they're not having to research anything they absolutely trust us and it's like you know here's here's the document we've made on this there's supporting material you check through it now and that's what they do you know and it's it, that's how we've done it for the last few years and it really works and a lot of legal teams won't work with campaign teams um but they do and we're really grateful for that because it's been able to advance the case a lot more and a lot sort of harder than it would have been. Do you know what I mean? It's more, there's a lot more substance to it, isn't there? Mm. So, Could you explain, because we've got a lot of international viewers, mm. what is the CCRC and who are they comprised of? Well, it's the, the Criminal Cases Review Commission. Uh, after a series of high-profile miscarriages of justice um, back several decades that um, Matt's alluded to earlier, the Birmingham Six and the, the Guildford Four. Um, this new mechanism was created. Uh, Parliament set up the, the body called the CCRC to review criminal cases where there was a question mark over the soundness of the conviction. Uh, and they have very wide powers to subpoena, in effect, information from the police, from forensic service or whoever they want to. So the issue of disclosure doesn't apply to them because they have the powers to get round any roadblocks in that that regard that we can't get round. Um, and what they're meant to do is to get all the relevant material, look at it, review it, and if they think that the, a particular conviction is unsound, then they refer it back to the Court of Appeal, who, if the Court of Appeal agree, will then overturn or quash or say that the conviction is unsound, uh, in which case the person is then freed. Uh, but that is the only mechanism that you can use in this country. So there is no alternative other than to putting your case through the CCRC. So how many people at the CCRC would be looking at Jeremy's case? Well, there, there, there are two layers, really. There are case workers who, who look at the real detail of it. So that they will be the ones that would go and get the extra disclosure. Hopefully, we'll go to Essex Police and say, right, give us all the call logs that you have after all these years and you know, look at them and say, well, there were two calls. Uh, if they consider that the uh, material justifies a referral, then they go to the upper layer of the CCRC, which are the commissioners who are appointed, I think, is it on a five-year no, tenure? Ones. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they sort of review the thing in the round. And if they agree that there is substance to what's being said, then they will recommend that it's forwarded to the Court of Appeal. So it, it, it's a two-stage process. And do they have a history of making fair decisions? <laughs> no. Well, their, their history, no. Their, 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 <laughs> their, well, their history is somewhat checkered. To, to be fair to them, they have referred Jeremy's case before in 2002, but because of the DNA evidence and their in, bizarre interpretation of it, they turned the appeal down. So it is possible you can get the CCRC to recommend it's referred, but then get knocked back by the Court of Appeal. Mm. It's How, very difficult to get the CCRC yeah. to do a referral. However, lately... So he's had one referral so far, but that failed. That was into... Yeah, because they said even though Sheila's DNA <laughs> was not in the silencer, so that should have been it, shouldn't it? No. Just because it wasn't in there doesn't mean her blood never had been. Yeah. Bizarre <gasps> sort of reasoning. Yeah. So lost the appeal. Alison Wonderland. 
Yes, very much. Exactly. I mean, you, well, you it's could, a lottery, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. very much. So. You, I mean, it's just, it, it, it's a risk of who who you get to, at yeah. that place. Yes. Who, but yes, it was so. That's, that's why this time it was a big decision to make that decision. Do we go with um, one huge, really strong piece of like so let all the silence, the evidence, and leave it at that? Or do we go with two? Or do we go with three? What shall we do? We went with a lot. It's like they go have it all and mm. um, there's eight issues but each issue might have 12 13 14 grounds of appeal within that issue so it's like they are Shotgun. Say it all, everything is ultra referenced so it's easy we've led them by the hand mm. so it's like this is what we're saying this is why this is why it's important that's the evidence this paragraph you read it there's a full document so it's up to them but I am absolutely convinced mm. not only will we get a referral, but that this information is so strong that and Germany when, will When do you think freedom. you will get some progress? We're six months in now with the CCRC. The submissions were made on the 10th of March. So I'm hopeful shortly. And I, I honestly don't think there are some of the issues that the CPS could contest mm. because there's no way out for them. Because if, if it is referred to the course of appeal, it's up to the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, which is the prosecuting authority. And they have to whether, bring a case. Yes. Yeah, yeah, whether they choose to contest it. And if they choose not to, then the, the Court of Appeal has to sort of rubber stamp it because there's no counter argument. Um, so if it's referred, we hope that the CPS won't contest it, but that remains to be seen. But in the past, it's that because you've got to go with fresh evidence. You can't go with an issue that's gone before the Criminal Case Review Commission before unless you've something new to add to it. So you have to have something new. So what we've done this time is like the judgments from before or their decisions from before where they go, we haven't accepted this because of ABC. Well, we've gone, all right then, well, you wouldn't accept it because of ABC. Now we've got this new evidence that not only proves ABC, but proves X, Y, Z as well. So take it away and have a look. So I'm really confident. But back to your original you. sort of point, how how fair are they in reviewing this? Because the commission has changed on a regular basis, it tends to sort of fluctuate. But lately, they have been very good. They've referred some very high-profile cases, for instance, the post office case, which involved hundreds of wrongfully convicted defendants. Um, so they've been much more proactive and much more likely to take a fair and balanced view of the case on its merits, which is all we need. What's life like inside for Jeremy? Has it, he been up and down the security levels? And, you know, for people who are convicted of harming women and kids, the prisoners sometimes attack those people. Does he have problems inside? Well, he's a Category A prisoner at the moment. So, so that's maximum security. Yeah. yeah. So he's he's highly restricted in in what but he, he can... was he was reduced briefly. Well, and the, then the, the story of that goes complaint. back to one of our favourite subjects, the relatives, mm, yes. because when there was talk about downgrading him to Category B, which would have made his life much better on a day to day basis, uh, the relatives immediately objected because they said their life would be at risk should he be <sighs> downgraded. And, you know, the Home Office, for political reasons, just agreed with them and kept him at Category A. So he's still in with the worst of the worst, and it's a pretty grim regime. It's, um, well, it's like we've recently done a podcast about German security status, and it's a, an issue with challenges every year. We have prison lawyers, and every year, you know, it, it passes all the, the prison tests and everything with such a low score. He's scoring lower than the guards and everything, you know. So it's ridiculously low score. Um so we challenge it every year. Every year is turned down for one reason or another, not because of any violence or anything. Uh, he helps other people learn. I mean, obviously the COVID's had restrictions, but, you know, he helps people re learn to read and write. Um, you know, it's just it's very receptive to the other people, isn't it, to the other men. He, but he keeps his cell to himself a lot because um, he's working on his case. So for 36 years he's been in the highest security mm. levels. But it's Except a very far six months. I can't imagine that the effect on mm. someone's mind. Well, yeah. You know, you talk about people being institutionalized. We've all seen Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, absolutely. And um, but it's people uh, don't realise. I mean, we didn't realise until recently because he didn't tell us. But it's like the regime, even through the night, it's mm. like 
So Jeremy has no privacy whatsoever. Every letter is read, every phone call is monitored, everything is recorded, visits are like you've a guard there. You know, we do the purple visits at the moment, there's a guard there, nothing private whatsoever. Every night, every hour, the lights on, the hatch is open, slam shut. So we didn't even realise that till recently because it protects us from his day-to-day -day life because he knows, you know, he doesn't want people seeing that aspect of it. And, you know, we don't talk about um, in prison conditions and things like that because that's not what we're about. We're about putting the evidence of Jeremy's innocence and making sure that that regime that he's under is going to finish soon you know, and that they're all going to stop. But so, he hasn't had a decent night's, you know, full night's sleep for 36 years, which... How does know. he pass the time? Well, he, he works. I mean, there, there is the opportunity to work in the in the prison. At times, obviously, during COVID, there wasn't. Um, Do you know uh, what his job is? Yeah, he works in a s sorting office for DHL. <laughs> um, so it's... Slave labour. It's fairly, yeah, it's fairly <laughs> mundane stuff. Within the gets prison. Him, gets, yeah. him out, <laughs> gets him out of his cell and, you know, gives him contact with other people. Yeah. And isn't he quite into exercise? Yeah, he does an awful lot of... Yeah, he goes to the gym a lot. Um, uh, but also, I mean, another aspect of it is just a very violent environment. You know, for instance, whatever, eight or nine years ago, he was at the telephone and, you know, behind him, someone came up and just slashed him across the neck. And it missed his carotid artery by millimeters, and he he was very lucky to survive that. And you can see he's got a big ten inch scar down the oh, down yeah. his neck. So when you're living under those conditions, it obviously puts a huge mental strain on somebody. Wow! Uh, particularly, <laughs> well, even more so when you're innocent and you know that you shouldn't be there. Has he written his life story? He's actually a very good writer, and he he's written stuff for our meetings. And he, 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 yeah, he writes things for our meetings and. Um, you know, obviously he gets a lot of posts and he writes, but he's, you know, very supportive to people. So we think you get people writing to Jeremy with like their personal problems <laughs> and, and then Jeremy will write them a letter back. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, it's just, it's just generous that way, isn't yeah. he? With but he gets hundreds of letters because he's obviously so so sort of high profile and he tries to, you know, reply to them all, how, <laughs> however sort of uh, is, strange yeah. they might be but. should we put his uh mailing address below the video because i know like mail is yeah. gold isn't it yeah that would that yeah, would yeah. be lovely thank yeah. you yeah. As well as all because i mean it's it's good to know because i mean it's such an anxious time for everybody at the moment but particularly jeremy because i mean we're not under that you know regime we can go out we can do what we like this is this is towards his shot we've got to do this because this is his chance mm. of freedom and i'm like i say i'm fully confident but for him to know that these people who are supporting him, who are fighting for him, who are making a voice and, you know, making themselves heard, and that means a lot to him because we get contacted by a lot of people and we're like, write to Jeremy, let him know what you've said to me. You know, let him know how much you support him because it's that that gives you the drive and the determination that, you know, and Jeremy will say, I'm not just doing this for me. I'm doing this for you lot and my supporters and my friends and you know so it 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 puts the focus off him in his head onto others and it it, it likes to be there for others it's such an oppressive environment and when you get that mail it's like the highlight of the mm. day for some people to read you know yes. have that communication that bridge to the outside world mm. yeah very yeah. much so because i mean to, for instance to, to illustrate how long he's been in there he, he's never used a mobile phone he's never held a mobile phone now, to us sitting around here, that just he, seems he absolutely never biz would have had email. Yeah, no, bizarre. No. Abs absolutely. So, you know, the world in his mind is stuck in 1985 because that's when he first went on remand. So, it's going to be quite an adjustment for him once he gets out. But I'm sure he'll. You know. I think it's important to say as well because some people think because we have Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts that that's Jeremy. It isn't Jeremy, it's the campaign and supporters who are running the Twitter accounts and the Facebooks. So. So, and all those links will be in the description box below this video if you want to support them um, do you have any final questions um, I just want to say thank you very much for thank coming so much to, for to meet us, us yeah. and um, you know I think your work is, is amazing you know you've been very tireless oh, in your you. campaigning so and I hope it makes progress shortly well, uh, hopefully, hopefully jeremy can come on the program very soon so for the people watching this then do you want to just give like a conclusion to what we've been 
talking about today, what, how they can get involved perhaps and contact you? Well, the, the initial thing, if they wanted to, is to write to Jeremy, it's to, to look at our website, to look at the evidence, make up their own mind. And if they agree with what we're saying, there are a number of ways they can get involved in the campaign just by joining the Facebook group at, at the minimum or contacting us to, to suggest any other ways they might help. Yeah, we, we have uh, three Twitter accounts. Um, we have J Bamba Facebook, Twitter. We have Free Bamba Now and Bamba Tweets. Um, somebody always active on those every day. We have our justice group on Facebook. And there's the website. You can email us through the website. So if you have any questions at all, please just ask us. Uh, join the Facebook group. At least please listen to the podcast because... You know, they are facts from the case material. There's no speculation in them. You know, not everything's positive. There's some negativity in that, but you've got to listen to them because it's giving you all the facts. And then you make your decision then. But I just on the behalf of Jeremy and the campaign, I want to thank you so much for giving us this opportunity because if we've got to make we've got to make our voice heard, we've got to make Jeremy's voice heard, and we've got to let th- the world know that. This is an innocent man who's 36 years of a stolen life who still hasn't had the opportunity to grieve for his family because he's even been denied that opportunity. And, you know, we, we, will, we will not stop. We will keep fighting until the day Jeremy walks free. And we just appreciate that you've given us this time and an opportunity to be able to, to you know, like make people aware but as i say and it we're happy to come back anytime as as the case progresses and we get to to the day of justice but it will happen well yvonne philip and matthew it's an honor to have all you guys on to detail this case because miscarriages of justice are close to my heart when i saw you know going through the american legal system and just saw the corruption and how people on death row are innocent and yet they they know and they hide the evidence and they execute these guys just before the governor's up for re-election just to get more votes to show that he's been tough on crime there's this cycle and there's, I mean, there's, there's, like, there's bigger psychopaths in the justice system yeah. than there are in the prison system but I say I with, with Jeremy's case because he is he was convicted on a 25-year tariff then it was changed to a whole life sentence so Jeremy is living a living death penalty so you know, he knows he's on a death sentence, but he, they're not going to execute him that way. They're executing him by keeping him incarcerated and away from freedom and liberty and, and his justice. And we've got to correct that. And I'm convinced he's innocent. All 10 things in this book were repeated today, just like they were recently in the Luke Mitchell case. So if you are interested in Miscarriages of Justice podcasts, we did cover the Luke Mitchell case a few months ago. So please let us know in the comments what you thought about this case today. All the links are down there in the description box if you want to join the movement. I urge you to do so. 36 years. I mean, I, I ended up serving six on a nine and a half year sentence and I felt myself getting a bit institutionalized and I saw people being for 20, 30 years. And even our first podcast guest was in for 34 years for a crime he hadn't committed. And to come out and have um, the great spirit he did have, and I'm imagining it, there's, there's parallels with Jeremy here whereby he's got this spirit that is just carrying him through this, his determination for the truth to come out. But it's so important that he does feel the love and support from around the world. I mean, I saw guys that the mail call comes and they're looking at the guard and the guard doesn't stop at the door. They get no mail and their faces are just like heartbroken. Small things in prison are magnified so we are going to put jeremy's mailing address in the description box as well as all of the links from today so if you are inclined to send jeremy a letter mail is absolute gold for prisoners so we appreciate all your love and support um, from around the world appreciate you guys coming in again um thanks to joe and james for coming and, and filming and, and recording the audio today and huge thank you to the subscribers. Subscription logo is in the corner of the screen. And I look forward to reading your comments um, on this one. And we're going to go and have a little meal now if you guys want to join us at the local pub. So <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs>